Hello, everyone. I'm Tim McCraner, an academic advisor at the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new to us, IWP is an independent graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degrees, two of which will be offered online beginning this fall, almost 20 certificates of graduate study, as well as other continuing ed opportunities. If you'd like to learn more about us, please visit, visit us at uh, iwp.edu. Our speaker today is Peter Campbell, an associate professor in the political science department at Baylor University. Now, with the help of Peter and his colleagues in that department, IWP was actually fortunate enough just this year to form an official partnership with Baylor University. Baylor students are now eligible for a variety of benefits at IWP, including a not insignificant partner scholarship if they are admitted into one of our MA programs. Peter holds an MA in War Studies from King's College London and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Notre Dame. He is the author of Military Realism, The Logic and Limits of Force and Innovation in the US Army, which was published by the University of Missouri Press in 2019. His areas of research include national security decision-making, civil military relations, strategy, IR scholarship and policy relevance, insurgency and counterinsurgency, the just war tradition and cyber warfare. Uh, welcome Peter and thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks Tom. Uh, before I open the floor to you, Peter, I just wanted to briefly mention the project as well as the person that actually brought the two of us together for the first time. And that is the Classics of Strategy and Diplomacy Project, whose founder, whose founder Patrick Garrity, recently passed away and who in fact helped put this talk together. Uh, fortunately for all of us, however, Garrity's project will continue and I sincerely hope uh, flourish. Now, if I understand correctly, the Classics of Strategy and Diplomacy project was actually relaunched this year, Peter, in fact, with your essay on Grant. And so before we get started, I was hoping you could just say a few words about what that project is and what made you want to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, so the Classics of Strategy and Diplomacy, um, it's in the name, uh, the, the idea of bringing together uh, analysis of classic works of strategy, political philosophy, and diplomacy uh, in order to uh, illuminate current national security and strategic debates. Um, I myself use uh, classic texts like Cicero, Machiavelli, Clausewitz, and William Shakespeare um, in my own teaching and writing about strategy. So uh, my um, uh, working with the classics of strategy and diplomacy just made a lot of sense for me. Uh, Grant especially worked well because uh, I'm in the process of writing a book on um, high-level military leaders who become heads of state. Uh, and so the opportunity to read Grant's memoir and to analyze it as a work of strategy uh, was just an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So, uh, and, I, and I plan to write more uh, and work more with the classics of strategy and diplomacy uh, as the years go on. Uh, great, thanks. Now, if you'd like to learn more about that project, which we'll be publishing some new essays very soon on Klaus Fitz, uh, The Book of Five Rings, among others, and which also includes, of course, Peter's original essay on Grant, uh, please visit them at classicsofstrategy.com. And with that rather obvious segue, the floor is now entirely yours, Peter. All right, thanks so much, Tim. Okay. Hi everybody, thanks and uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to um, talk about Grant and uh, his, especially his memoir as a work of uh, strategic thinking. Um, so really one of the most fascinating things about Grant's memoir is the origin of the, of the book itself. Um, this really is a great story that was almost never told. Uh, Grant was going to keep silent about the Civil War and not record his memoirs, um, but a personal financial crisis uh, made it necessary for him to write his memoirs in order to save his family from financial destitution. Uh, he was taken in by a con artist named Ferdinand Ward uh, and lost uh, really all of his money and that of uh, his family and friends. Uh, and was, uh, in essence, forced to write the memoir to try and save his family from uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and then a second crisis emerges uh, in the same period. This is after Grant has uh, 
you know, resign from the presidency, where he's diagnosed with throat cancer um, related to his years of cigar smoking. The memoir itself is actually published by Mark Twain. Uh, and he said this of the memoir, there is no higher literature than these modest, simple memoirs. Their style is flawless. Some pretty high praise coming from uh, Mark Twain. Grant actually dies only one week after he completes the memoir. Uh, I would say it was as if his life ebbed away with every page that he wrote. Now, the really important thing to keep in mind here is that Grant is writing his Civil War memoir from the perspective of someone who's just spent two terms as president of the United States. So he's looking back on a Civil War experience uh, from that perspective. Well, as the title implies, uh, I think that character plays a very important role in strategy. So one of the things that we need to talk about are the origins of Ulysses S. Grant. So he's born in Point Pleasant, Ohio in 1822 to his father, uh, Jesse Root Grant, who was a tanner, and his mother, Hannah Simpson Grant. He was a very serious child, uh, and he this is likely a disposition that he inherited from his mother, not his father. Uh, his father was um, not reserved at all. Uh, he was uh, very loquacious and very proud of his uh, famous son. Uh, his mother, on the other hand, never uh, took Grant's fame too seriously. Uh, after the Civil War, when he visited his family, um, she said to him, well, Ulysses, you've become a great man now haven't you? Uh, she didn't even attend Grant's inauguration, either, either of them, uh, but stayed at home um, to, uh, some say, uh, knock the cobwebs off the back porch. I would argue that the humility that Grant inherited from his mother would actually prove to be a great asset for him as a strategist, and we'll get more into that. Grant had a very limited education in his early childhood, and his father was painfully aware of this. Grant accepts a position at West Point really under pressure from, from his father. Uh, Grant wasn't interested. As you can see here, he said, he wrote, a military life had no charms for me. I had not the faintest idea of staying in the army, even if, it should be gra if I should be graduated, which I did not expect. At West Point, Grant was not the best student, but he excelled in, especially in horsemanship. Uh, and he actually had a uh, horse jump, uh, a, um, a record for uh, a, a leap he did on a horse that stood into the 2000s, actually. Of his free time, he said, much of my time, I am sorry to say, was devoted to novels, but not those of a trashy sort. I read all of Bueller's then published, Cooper's, Marriott's, Scott's, Washington Irving's works, Levers, and many other that I do not now remember. So Grant spent much of his time reading novels when he was at West Point. He graduates from West Point, much to his surprise, in 1843. But before he can leave the army, uh, he, the United States goes to war with Mexico over Texas, and Grant is going to serve. Now, Grant, reflecting on the Mexican War, said that it was one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker power. This was Grant's impression at the time. Grant wrote that America was, quote, following the bad example of European monarchies in not considering justice in their desire to acquire additional territory. Nevertheless, Grant did not shirk his duty as an officer in the US Army and fought for the duration. It is in the Mexican War that Grant learned some very important lessons, um, both about the character of fellow officers and about the kind of officer that he wanted to become. He fights in the Mexican War with more than 50 officers who he would fight against in the American Civil War. Robert E. Lee, Joseph E. Johnston, John Bell Hood, Gideon Pillow, and Simon Buckner, to name only a few. And Grant, reflecting on this, said, the acquaintance thus formed was of immense service to me 
in the War of the Rebellion. I mean that I learned of the characters of those of whom I was afterwards opposed. In the Mexican War, Grant also has his first experience of combat, and very importantly, he becomes aware of the awesome responsibility of command. As he watched uh, American forces approach one of their early battles in the Mexican War, he said, he wrote, as I looked down that long line of about 3,000 armed men advancing towards a larger force also armed, I thought what a dreadful responsibility General Taylor must feel commanding such a host and so far from friends. No soldier could face either danger or responsibility more calmly than he, meaning Taylor. And this is Grant reflecting years later on the qualities that Taylor um, exemplified. These are qualities, right, more rarely found than genius or physical courage. That's how important he thought the willingness to accept responsibility was. Grant uh, really, really admired General Zachary Taylor and he imitated him in dress, uh, command style, and even in his writing style. People who served under Taylor and then served under Grant um, sometimes consider them almost mirror images of each other. But we are here not just to talk about Grant, uh, Grant's history uh, and the Civil War, but about strategy itself. So let's talk a little bit about the concept. So at the outbreak of the Civil War, Grant becomes an officer of Union Volunteers. And then obviously by the end of the Civil War, he is in, he is in charge of all the Union forces. So the definition of strategy that I'm employing here is that strategy is the use of military forces to achieve the aim of the war. And the political object of the war sets that aim. So very importantly, strategy occupies the area between politics and military operations. The strategist cannot ignore the elements of military operations, logistics, um, operational and tactical considerations, but they must also consider the place those in their proper context, which is provided by the political object of the war. Grant was well aware of this, and we see numerous examples of this in his analysis of the uh, battles that he uh, participated in during the American Civil War. Shiloh, right? April 6th to 7th, 1862. Grant is leading the Army of the Tennessee, and he is eventually victorious in the Battle of Shiloh. But he recognizes in the Battle of Shiloh that it transformed the, uh, the, the, his perception of the American Civil War and what was required uh, of the, the Union forces. According to Grant, the Battle of Shiloh was a strategic turning point. The Union had to change its strategic object to achieve its political aim. Before Shiloh, the Union and Grant himself thought that a victory in the American Civil War could be achieved if the Union could defeat one major Confederate force. However, the lesson of Shiloh was that this was no longer the case. When Confederate armies were collected, which not only attempted to hold the line further south, but assumed the offense and made such a gallant effort to regain what had been lost, Grant argued, then Indeed, I gave up all idea of saving the Union except by complete conquest. So Grant was a careful observer of the strategic implications of the military operations that he was involved in. Another instance of this is his analysis leading up to the Battle of Vicksburg. So in strategic and logistical terms, in order to starve the Confederacy in the American Civil War, the Union had to gain command of the Mississippi River. And in December of 1862, Grant knew that Vicksburg was the next target for his military operations. Now this is in December, so winter's on the way, and the principles of supply 
would dictate that Grant should move his army north to Memphis instead of proceeding south towards Vicksburg. But Grant, the strategist, thought otherwise. He argued that it was important that they move towards Vicksburg immediately. Grant even overruled Sherman, his, one of his favorite and most trusted subordinates, who argued that Grant should not proceed towards Vicksburg because of the principles of supply. So why, why did Grant argue for this movement? Well, he said that the demands of strategy and politics were more important here than the demands of the military principles of supply. Grant knew that in 1862, the political will to continue the war was waning in the North. The election of 1862 had gone against supporters of the war and voluntary enlistments had stopped requiring the imposition of a draft. So Grant wrote, it was my judgment at the time that to make a backward movement as long as that from Vicksburg to Memphis would be interpreted by many of those yet full of hope for the preservation of the Union as a defeat and further undermine their willingness to pursue the war to its conclusion. Grant wrote further, the country was already disheartened over the lack of success on the part of our armies. The problem for us was to move forward to a decisive victory or our cause was lost. No progress was being made in any other field and we had to go on. Grant recognized that without the political support of the forces of the Union, the war could not be brought to a successful conclusion. Any military action, no matter how well justified by military principles and sound logistics that undermined political support for the war effort could not be contemplated strategically. So as Grant put it in his memoir, there was nothing left to be done but to go forward to decisive victory. This move led to months of inaction by Grant's forces. However, the final result was the Vicksburg campaign, which is considered one of the greatest pieces of operational art ever executed by a military commander. So Grant had some clear operational skills uh, when it came to uh, the Vicksburg campaign, but his eye was always on strategy as well. Now, there were some limits, people argued, to Grant's abilities as a commander. And uh, General Sherman actually argued that Grant had significant uh, deficiencies in his military education. Sherman wrote that he considered himself smarter than Grant and much more knowledgeable in the areas of military history, strategy, grand tactics, organization, supply, and administration. One wonders what else there is, um, but he said that I'll tell you where he, Grant, beats me and where he beats the world. He don't care a damn for what the enemy does out of his sight, but it scares me like hell. Now, this is an analysis by Sherman of the major problem, that incomplete information about the actions and presence and intentions of an enemy can paralyze a commander with worry. And Sherman was arguing that Grant just didn't have that problem. I would argue that it's not that Grant didn't worry, it was that Grant had a, um, a keen understanding of the effect of worry on commanders. So in one of his first engagements in the American Civil War, Grant said he had just come over a rise and he was expecting to see the enemy force on the other side. And he came over that rise and saw their camp had been abandoned. And that's when he said, it occurred to me at once that Harris, which is the opposing commander, had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. 
This was a view of the question I had never taken before, but it was one I never forgot afterwards. I never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as I had his. The lesson was valuable, and Grant never forgot it. And he used that lesson for the rest of his operational planning and strategic planning for the remainder of the Civil War. So it wasn't that Grant didn't worry about the actions of the adversary, but instead, before he launched any operation, he did everything that he could in his power to produce as much worry in the opposing commander. So that was one of his insights. And we still see this today, right? In a 2017 interview um, with Secretary of Defense Mattis, he was asked, what keeps you awake at night? And Mattis's uh, unsurprisingly laconic response was nothing. I keep the other people awake at night, Mattis replied, right? So this idea that your actions produce worry in your adversary as much as um, their actions can produce worry in you. And what, that's one of the things that the strategist needs to take advantage of, is to get into the head of the uh, other strategist. As Sun Tzu said, the only way to, to win is to defeat the strategy of your adversary. So another central insight provided by Grant's memoir is the importance of character. And the importance of individual characters in leadership and strategy. His assessment of the character of opposing commanders often guided his military operations against them. So Grant was not only a good strategist, but he was a very good judge of character, and that actually made him a better strategist. So a very good example here is in operations uh, related to Fort Donaldson between February 11th and 16, 1862. The rebel general there was General Floyd, and he was in command, but in Grant's assessment, he was not a uh, real, he was not a soldier. He would instead defer to the pretensions of General Pillow, his subordinate, uh, who Grant knew from uh, the fighting in Mexico. Pillow, Grant argued, was conceited and prided himself much on his service in the Mexican War. Uh, the historian McPherson agrees, saying that Pillow was a self-important Tennessee politician. Based on his assessment of Pillow's character, Grant moved an outnumbered force clo close to Fort Donaldson knowing that Pillow would not have the assertiveness to attack. Grant trusted so much in his assessment of Pillow's character and his pretensions that he disposed his forces in a manner that was dangerous if his assessment were mistaken. During the, during the, the siege, Floyd orders a breakout attack on the advice of Pillow and Buckner another officer that Grant knew from West Point. It failed because Pillow was disconcerted by the disorder and casualties suffered by his victorious troops. Pillow then advised Floyd to withdraw the forces over Buckner's agonizing pro agonized protests, uh, and they returned to their trenches in the breakout attack that was almost successful fails in the end. In the end, Floyd and Pillow escape and leave Buckner in charge, uh, and Grant takes Fort Donaldson. This is just one example that at crucial junctures during the Civil War, Grant relied on his ability to read the character of other commanders to make key decisions. Now, obviously, the question becomes, what about Robert E. Lee? Well, when it came to Robert E. Lee, Grant was very upset by the public perception of Lee's abilities as a military commander. He thought he was significantly overrated. He argued that there was a tendency among people, quote, to clothe the commander of a large army whom they do not know with almost superhuman abilities. And the Northern press, uh, according to Grant, helped 
increase uh, Lee's stature exponentially with what he thought was inaccurate reporting. Um, both in the North and the South, the press reported that the number of Lee's forces was always lowered and that of the national forces was exaggerated, Grant argued. Southern generals were models of chivalry and valor, Grant remarked bit bitterly in 1878. Our generals were venal and competent coarse. Everything that our opponent did was perfect. Lee was a demigod, Jackson was a demigod, while our generals were brutal butchers, right? Even uh, Abraham Lincoln's wife called General Grant no general, but just a butcher. Grant said, however, I had known Lee personally and knew that he was mortal, and it was just as well that I felt this. Grant's own mother was actually worried about uh, him facing General Lee uh, and asked him, wasn't he afraid of when he would finally have to face Robert E. Lee in battle? And Grant said, I know Lee as well as he knows himself. I know all his strong points and all his weak ones. I intend to attack his weak points and flank his strong ones. Uh, very reminiscent of Sun Tzu, uh, writing thousands of years before Grant. Grant's assessment was that Lee was of slow conservative nature, without imagination or humor, all was the same with grave dignity. I never could see in his achievements what justified his reputation. The illusion that nothing but heavy odds beat him will not stand the ultimate light of history. Sherman shared Grant's assessment, was somewhat biased likely, but he argued that Lee's approach to war was too direct. He used the analogy of a house and said that while Lee attacked the front porch, Grant would attack the kitchen and the bedroom. Grant's approach to war was more informed by a long-term strategic design. Grant did not use his powers of perception only on his adversaries, however. He also very importantly used them on his subordinates. He assessed their characters, sometimes uh, very penetratingly, if respectfully, he, he, he acknowledged their abilities. In one analysis of Warren, who was uh, one of the heroes of the Battle of Gettysburg, Grant had argued, when he did get ready to execute an order, and after giving most intelligent instructions to division commanders, he would go in with one division, holding the others in reserve, until he could superintend their movements in person also, forgetting that division commanders could execute an order without his presence. His difficulty was constitutional and beyond his control. He was an officer of superior ability, Grant argued, quick perception and personal courage to accomplish anything that he could that could be done with a small command. So Grant recognized the, the, the virtues and the ability of Warren, but argued that uh, because of his character, he was ill-suited to higher command. So because he could not trust his subordinates to follow his orders. Trust entails risk and Warren was unwilling to take the risk to put the operation in the hands of his subordinates to execute. Grant, on the other hand, led by the speed of trust. He trusted his subordinates to take the initiative, the principle called mission command, that was very important to Grant. This is one of the main reasons why, why being a good judge of character is so important, because you must be good, be a good judge of character to fit characters to the tasks and thereby increase the likelihood of success at the highest levels. And sorry, at the highest levels of command, this is the only way 
that leaders can control the execution of operations, right? It is by putting the right people in the right place to execute the operation. I would argue, argue also that one of Grant's most important qualities was his humility. He did not become so attached to his own plans for operations in the Civil War that he was unwilling to listen to reason. For example, after commanding Union victory at Chattanooga, Grant allowed one of his subordinates to persuade him to alter part of his campaign plan. Instead of pushing Longstreet out of East Tennessee, as Grant had originally ordered, he listened to General Foster, pictured here, who said Longstreet was just perfect where he was. I thought the advice was good and adopted that view, countermanding the order to, for the pursuit of Longstreet. Again, in regards to the campaign in the Shenandoah Valley, Grant wrote up a campaign plan and went to visit Phil Sheridan, who would execute it. However, when he interviewed Sheridan, he saw that the cavalry commander, quote, was so clear and so positive in his views and so confident of success. I said nothing about my campaign plan and did not take it out of my pocket. Grant also admired humility in others. He said, it is men who wait to be selected and not those who seek from whom we may always expect the most efficient service. Channeling Luke 14 here, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Grant's character did not make him liable to excessive pride in his own designs, which might have blinded him to reasonable alternatives. Grant was humble and that humility made him genuinely open-minded when it came to dealing with his subordinates. So what are some of the lessons for strategy that we can take from Grant's memoirs? And this, this is definitely an incomplete list. Well, first of all, I would argue that a strategist education must be broad, right? And it should include literature and especially great works of fiction, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Twain, Melville, right? Should also include the classics of strategy and diplomacy. The capacity to accept responsibility is an essential quality of strategists, but they also have to trust subordinates and give them the authority to act within their own sphere, which produces fear because it's a risky thing to do. We can talk about instances during the Civil War where uh, taking those risks didn't necessarily pay off for Grant. Strategists must be good judges of character, both of their subordinates, their superiors, and their competitors. Uh, the study of literature is the study of character and the tendency of character types. So yet another, perhaps this is something Grant learned from all those novels he read while he was at West Point. The reason leaders must be good judges of character is because they have to fit characters to the tasks that they're assigned and thereby increase the likelihood of success. As a, again, at the highest levels, this is maybe the only control that a strategist has over execution. Strategists must not rigidly apply general rules to every situation, right? They must engage prudence, right? The wise application of universal principles to particular situations, as Grant did at Vicksburg, right? Logistics said one thing, strategy said the other. Grant went with what strategy demanded. And then finally, strategists should be humble and not so pridefully wedded to their own designs, but be truly open to alternative way, uh, modes of operation. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your, your uh, questions and our discussion. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, before I take any questions from the audience, I, would, I just wanted to ask two uh, of my own. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk and a number of times uh, in your essay, 
that Grant clearly recognized that his military forces were an instrument intended to achieve the political aim of the war. Uh, but of course, what that political aim was, was sort of an open question at times, uh, namely the preservation of the Union or ending slavery. Uh, and of course, this sort of ambiguity has led to problems uh, in some of the conflicts that the United States has been involved in since the Civil War. And so hopefully without having to go into too many historical details, does Grant ever talk about the problem of multiple political objectives that may or may not be in tension with one another? Or does he ever discuss how that ambiguity affected the decisions that he had to make on the battlefield? He definitely talks about how the ambiguity of the objective led to political interference on the part of the um, uh, leaders in Washington, D.C. Uh, Grant always knew that the total defeat of the Confederate forces would be required, right? Um, so long as the Union decided not to negotiate, uh, as he said after the Battle of Shiloh, it would be required to completely conquer the Confederacy to impose um, the Union's will on the Confederacy. And at the same time, the Confederacy knew, commanders in the Confederacy knew that the longer they could prolong the war, the greater the likelihood that the Union would be forced to negotiate and end the war. Um, so, so Grant noted the ambiguity at times uh, and, and saw it in person. So he would write orders that he would send to, for instance, Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, and the Secretary of War would actually take those orders and rewrite them uh, because he thought Grant uh, was not uh, doing what he ought to do, for instance, to pr protect Washington from Confederate forces. Uh, so Grant recognized that, that other people thought that there was this ambiguity, but for him, I don't believe that there was ever any doubt that total conquest and defeat of Confederate forces in the field was the only way to achieve the political objectives of, of the Union. I don't think he ever had any doubt. Great, thanks. Uh, my second question, while reading your essay uh, on the website, I couldn't help but think about whether Grant would agree more with Clausewitz or Sun Tzu uh, when those two do happen to disagree. And uh, contrary to your talk right now, you, you don't mention Sun Tzu in the, the essay. And although Grant's thinking clearly and often does reflect uh, that of Clausewitz, that one particular aspect of his thought that seems to indicate uh, a slight preference for Sun Tzu, however unintentionally, of course, I presume, is Grant's appreciation for the psychological concerns and considerations of the enemy, uh, as opposed to simply the commander in question. Uh, I think this comes out quite nicely in your discussion of Grant's, uh, how Grant confronts the problem of uncertainty in war, uh, namely to make the other guy more confused than you are, uh, his threatening of Richmond, uh, namely his reliance uh, on the fear of Lee's political leaders as opposed to Lee himself, which perhaps you can talk about now because I don't believe you covered in the, the talk, uh, and also Grant's reliance on understanding the character of his enemy. So uh, my question mainly is, did Grant use non-military means uh, of achieving a psychological impact such as disinformation or other intelligence operations, or did he simply rely on military maneuvers to achieve that effect? Well, Grant, he, he really appreciated the psychological effects that his operations had on, uh, on opposing commanders. And he, I'm really glad that you brought up the instance of his, his movement towards Richmond, um, because in that case, Grant tries to uh, tries to inspire in the Confederate political leaders the same sort of interference in military operations that Grant himself was experiencing at the hands of uh, the, Union, uh, the Union leaders. Uh, less so President Lincoln, but uh, there, were, there were other leaders at the time who were uh, interfering with Grant's military operations. Uh, so, so Grant would um, use military operations to, as I said, inspire worry, confusion, uh, and confront leaders with choices, basically confronting leaders with choices where neither choice was a good one. 
right? No matter no matter what they did, uh, Gr Grant would get some advantage out of it. All you see this over and over again in his design of military plans. He says, you know, I'm going to do this, and either they're going to follow me, or they don't, or they won't. And either way, I'm still going to uh, going to be able to uh, get what I want out of this military operation. So he he was always uh, planning for um, no matter what happened, he would have he would have the advantage. Um, so I mean. I don't want to get too much into the debate between uh, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz because I could just talk all day about that. Um, but because uh, because I think people underestimate the importance to which that's that Clausewitz puts on the psychological elements of war. Um, but I think very much the, the thing is about Grant is that he he just had a lot of common sense, right? Yeah. Hamilton Fish said of Grant. He has an incredible amount of good common sense. And when he's left alone, he's able to use it, right? Uh, and, and Grant said things like, I hope nobody realizes that uh, I never learned the doctrine that I use, right? That he would always just, sort of, he was always sort of just using common sense, uh, reflecting on himself, right? On the effects that his enemy's operations had on him and then trying to impose those uh, same as I said, worries on on his uh, on his opponents, right? So character psychology, yes, vitally important, vitally important to Grant. Uh, that's a that's a fantastic question. That's almost an essay in itself. Uh, great. So there are a couple questions in the Q and A. Uh, for Daniel would uh, like if you could talk a little bit um, about Grant's sense of urgency and how a sense of urgency fits with his strategy and strategic thinking in general. I mean, yes, Grant definitely had a sense of urgency in the American Civil War because he realized that the adversary, the Confederacy, if they were smart, they would try to protract the war. And he knew that that was a choice that he did not have, right? Um, interestingly, when Lee is selected as one of the main Confederate commanders, um, Grant rejoices that Johnson wasn't selected because Johnson knew that if the Confederacy stayed on the defensive, that they could protract the war and probably gain concessions from the, from the Union. Uh, so, so Grant was happy that uh, the more direct uh, and stolid commander of Lee was selected instead of uh, Johnson. So he had a sense of urgency, and this really drove the campaign uh, in the East at the end of the war, which was uh, one of the bloodiest in the whole uh, of the Civil War. But it was driven by the realization that Grant had that he was running out of time. The Union was running out of time, right? At the same time, for instance, that you know, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, those great victories, right? There are, there are draft riots in New York City, right? So Grant knew that he had to win and win as quickly as possible. And that meant things like um, the Battle of the Wilderness, right? Major engagements where he brought all of his force to bear to try and do everything he could to crush the Confederate forces because he knew that politically he didn't have time uh, to sit around and wait for, um, for better opportunities. He had to sort of make his own luck as it were. So yeah, absolutely. Urgency played a really big part in, uh, in the way he approached, uh, especially the conclusion of the war. Great question. Uh, Mason asks, are there any specific novels that you would recommend that beginner students of strategy should read? I, I would recommend William Shakespeare. I think uh, if character is important in strategy, there may be no author who better understands the human character than William Shakespeare. Um, uh, shameless self-plug, uh, my, my colleague and I, Richard Jordan, uh, for instance, wrote an article on Shakespeare's Coriolanus and how it can teach us about how to educate strategists, right? And part of that education, as I argued, is um, is reading literature because that's where characters are found, right? Um, and I think, uh, especially the Henriad, 
think is just a fantastic uh, analysis of character and strategy and politics. Um, so Shakespeare, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty pat answer, but uh, there's a reason uh, he was he was a great observer of human character. Uh, great, thanks, Peter. I think that's uh, that's it for the questions. Unless anyone had a last minute one, yeah, seconds. Uh, well, I'd like to thank. Oh wait, um, <laughs> Robert wants to know why can't West Point produce a grant today? <laughs> hmm. Why can't West Point? Why couldn't West Point produce a grant today? Um, I think West Point is actually doing a pretty good job. I had a, a panel discussion with them the other day, and uh, right the um, the editor of the volume, the the edition of Grant's memoirs that I used is actually Elizabeth Samet, who is a, the English professor, one of the English professors at West Point. Um, so I think the potential at West Point is to uh, uh, th there's potential there to develop great strategists, but but so much of strategy is about character, right? So it's it's very difficult to teach um, to teach that. Uh, as I said, you know, much of Grant's character, his humility, for instance, came from his mother, right? His 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 personal life experience. Um, so I think the potential is is there, but Great strategists, you know, they're they're pretty rare. That's just it's just a fact. Like great novelists, great, you know, great philosophers, uh, they don't come around. They don't come around every day. So, so I'm still holding out hope for for West Point, and and I know too from my discussions with them that they're working to uh, to to make better strategists. It's, it's a real concern for them because especially in this age of um, unconventional war uh, where politics is such an important element of the conflict, um, strategic thinking is vital um, in military officers, I think. Well, related to that, we have another question about what lessons should U.S. policymakers and defense strategists in an era of great power competition draw from your research? Uh, and in your essay, I think you do allude to a couple of things, but not uh, in your talk. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I think that one of the things that my analysis of, of Grant's memoir showed me is that really we need to have a, a we need to try and do really good assessments of uh, leaders in countries that are opposed to to our interests in the international system, right? Um, and not just in auto, highly autocratic regimes, right? Uh, both and both allies and adversaries. Um, so this is nothing new to the intelligence community. They do they do stuff like this all the time. Uh, but I think there's a tendency, especially if you're the most powerful country on the face of the earth, to put a lot of emphasis on material capabilities uh, and not as much emphasis on, uh, I guess what I would call psychic or character capabilities, which um, are actually extremely important in the execution of uh, military and, and I would argue diplomatic and political operations as well. So um, that's, that's one of the big lessons. I, I wasn't expecting to find that in Grant's memoir, honestly. Um, and that was one of the most surprising things that I that I took from it. Uh, Mason threw up another interesting question. Uh, was Grant a man of faith? Uh, and if so, did that faith play a role in his strategic outlook and in the development of his character as a whole? I would say definitely. Yeah, he was definitely a man of faith. Um, yes. So Grant had an interesting, for, just as a for instance, Grant had a really interesting view of human nature. Right. He, 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 I mean, it's very similar to the founders in some ways. Uh, he thought that human beings were uh, often looking out for their own interests, often looking to benefit their friends and harm their enemies. Uh, but he also said in a number of places that he had no patience for people who thought that human beings were only motivated by self interest. Right. He thought that there was. Uh, a real part of human nature that was dedicated to the service of others. 
Um, and I think he exemplified that in his own life. Uh, so definitely, I think he was a man of faith. Um, but he was also he also had a skeptical streak when it came to um, to human beings. And, and I mean, I'm sure trying to manage reconstruction uh, increased his skepticism uh, of because that was one of the great challenges of his of his presidency. Uh, but yes, I think I think he was a man of faith for sure, and it informed uh, how he approached um, politics and war. I think. Uh, Daniel asked if you could comment a little bit more on the perception that Grant was a butcher, uh, and I wanted to add a little bit to this uh, from a question I thought about asking, and that is, to what extent did Lincoln contribute to this perception? Because at times uh, it seems as if Lincoln did think that. Grant was nothing but a man of action, and that's what he needed. Uh, and so my question sort of would be, to what extent did Lincoln uh, appreciate uh, Grant as a strategist and not simply as a butcher, if he did at all? <laughs> Obviously, his wife did, but what did Lincoln himself <laughs> Right, right. Um, so I think when, when they would meet sometimes, uh, Lincoln and Grant, um, Grant would surprise Lincoln with how how much he was thinking strategically. For instance, uh, when they're debating, um, you know, after Atlanta has fallen and Sherman is now free to um, to join the operations uh, in the East, uh, Grant says we still need to make sure that that Meade's army is the one that goes after Lee and destroys Lee's army. And Lincoln says, well, I don't care who does it. I just want it done. And Grant, uh, thinking, I would argue, actually in grand strategic terms, argues, no, we, we, need, we need it to be the forces from the states in the Midwest, because when the war is over, we don't want the uh, Sherman's army to say that they did all the fighting. Right? So he was even thinking uh, more strategically than Lincoln was. Uh, Lincoln was thinking, how can we get this war done? Grant was thinking, in part, how can we fight this war in a way that will make the Union stronger politically in the way that it is fought, right? Which uh, I think is a very, you know, very astute uh, political and strategic observation, right? That doesn't sound much like a butcher to me. Uh, and, and I think the fact of the matter is that that uh, to go back to the urgency question, right? Grant knew that he was running out of time and that he had to defeat the Confederacy as quickly as possible. And that meant direct military engagements. And, uh, you know, they would, the way he expressed it was he said, by the time he started his big push towards Richmond, it wasn't clear to the Confederacy or to the Union who could whip, is how he described it, right? Who could win? And the Union had to make it clear to the Confederacy as quickly as possible that they could not win, right? That the, that the, that the Union would, uh, in fact, engage them in battle and, uh, and destroy their forces. And Grant did that not because he was a mindless butcher of men, but because the political circumstances left him no choice. Uh, Daniel also asks, how did... Grant handle uh, the criticism, and I think he means how did he handle the criticism during the war itself? Uh, you touched a little bit upon how he didn't want to write the memoirs until personal mm -hmm. circumstances uh, interfered, uh, but are there any other indications how he dealt with it on a more personal level? I think maybe what Daniel means. Yeah, he... <laughs> Especially he asks in uh, relation to Cold Harbor. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, at the I believe it's the second, uh, the second, um, uh, the second engagement at Cold Harbor. Grant says, "I regretted that for the rest of my life." Mm -hmm. right. He thought that it was unnecessary, uh, and he wished he hadn't done it. Um, now, I think Grant took the criticism pretty hard, um, and as you can see in in the the in the eighteen seventies when he's actually doing his tour around the world. Uh, and he's doing these interviews uh, with uh, Russell Young, this reporter. He talks about the way that he was very frustrated with the way both the press in the North and the South 
uh, portrayed uh, himself and other commanders. He thought it was extremely unfair. Um, though I do think that he thought Lincoln took the criticism harder than he did. Uh, Lincoln was, uh, Grant, Grant, Grant says in a number of places that he thought Lincoln was taking the criticism against himself uh, very hard. And Robert, who is the one who asked the question about um, West Point, uh, I think is qualifying his question a little bit. Uh, in particular, this is the second time uh, he writes, we have lost a war to insurgents, uh, namely Vietnam and Afghanistan. And so what do you think would Grant, what would Grant have done in those wars? <sighs> not fought them. Yeah. Um, not to be, not to be, to put too fine a point of it on it, but um I'm not sure that Grant would have uh, engaged directly in those wars with US forces, right? Um, if we look, for instance, at, uh, at his, um, his use of proxy forces in Mexico after the American Civil War, um, he was happy to uh, use proxy forces to try and achieve uh, American objectives. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just a very, very difficult question uh, to answer. Um, that's, that's a book project in itself. But um, I, maybe he would, he would not have, he would not have uh, engaged in either of those conflicts. Well, I think that is it. Um, I would like to thank Peter and all of you who joined us today. Uh, if you are interested in attending other upcoming events, uh, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu, that's iwp.edu, uh, and be a lookout for uh, Peter's book in the hopefully not too distant future. Thanks, everyone, and good night. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.